Oh, oh, we're fantastic. Live. oh fantastic. Good. Thank you, everyone. Yes, <laughs> yes thank, thank you. you. The miracle, miracle of modern, modern technology, technology is still, still in process, in process with, with us. us. We're sure, we're sure glad, glad you're, you're joining us. And thank, and thank you very, you very much. much. We're, we're excited, excited about, about this series, series that we're just, just about, about to create. create. With, with the Spencer, Spencer Fluman and Phil, and Phil Barlow. Barlow. Of the, of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute, Institute at BYU. BYU. And I'm and Larry, Larry Eastland with, with the John A. Witzel Foundation, Foundation at USC. So together, so together we're partnering, we're partnering on, bringing on bringing you this exciting, exciting series, series on the Book of Mormon Conversations. conversations. The, John the John A. Witzel Foundation, Foundation is proud to be a part here. Part here. Uh, uh, we're housed basically at the University of Southern And with Spencer and Phil at the Neil A. Maxwell Institute at BYU. So with that, let me just make one brief introduction then. Uh, Phil, uh, Spencer, um, introduce and say hi, and then I have just a short announcement and we'll get right into it. Thanks everyone uh, for joining us tonight. Um, it looks like we had an echo at the start, but I think we may have uh, fixed it, I hope. I'm keeping one eye on the uh, comments section. You're all keeping us uh, up to date. Thank you for that. Uh, we're very glad to join you tonight. I'm Spencer Fluman. From, uh, I'm the Executive Director of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at BYU. Phil Barlow uh, at my left. Uh, forgive us for the lack of social distance. Uh, it's a long story, but uh, you'll be patient with us there. And um, we are safe. And we are safe. We are safe. Um, Phil's the Associate Director at the Maxwell Institute, and we're grateful to partner with the Widso Foundation. Uh, we are a research unit at BYU dedicated to religious scholarship. Uh, we, uh, our mission is to gather and nurture disciple scholars who can uh, speak with... Uh, uh, rigor and learning in, in academic forms, but also translate that work for Latter-day Saints in an effort to inspire and fortify Latter-day Saints uh, in their faith and in their understanding of the gospel and, uh, and scripture, etc. So that is, uh, that is the mission of the Institute, and we're here to talk about a book series that, uh, that we're publishing this year in support of the church's Come Follow Me uh, curriculum. And this book series was conceived uh, as a, a, not a replacement for, but a supplement to that curriculum. And we're really excited about it. We're going to, um, we're going to overflow with enthusiasm as we talk about it tonight. It'll be, it's going to be hard to, uh, to hide that. Uh, but that's, uh, that's what we're uh, here to talk about tonight. This inaugurates a series of conversations with the authors of those series volumes. In short, 12 volumes, basically one per book on the book of, uh, from the Book of Mormon, where we've asked authors to provide a brief theological introduction to those books of Scripture. Um, 12 different authors. With those volumes are brief. They are handy. They are beautiful. They are readable. They are uh, probing. Uh, they are challenging. And we're excited for you to meet those authors. So tonight is just one big, long invitation to think along uh, with those authors about the Book of Mormon. We, um, we have a kind of working mission statement for the series. I'm going to read it right off the back of one of the books. The Book of Mormon Brief Theological Introductions seeks a series seeks Christ in Scripture by combining intellectual rigor and the disciples' yearning for holiness. And that encapsulates what we're after in these volumes, so we're excited to to chat uh, tonight. Uh, Larry, thank you for partnering with us in the Witso Foundation. Thank all of you for joining us, uh, hundreds of you across the world. Uh, thank you for taking time out to be with us. We're excited to uh, introduce the series to you. Phil, you have something to add? Uh, we won't need any more introduction on that. Okay. okay. Well, well, the Witso Wits Wits Foundation, Foundation is yes. founded on Latter-day Saint uh, scholarship and life at the University of Southern California. 
And we're basically a broad reach interfaith foundation to bring together people of faith. And we think this series is a marvelous way to begin this uh, Crowdcast series. So thank you for joining us. I see from the side, you know how to work the Crowdcast comments. On the bottom, you'll see an ask the question. If you have a question for, for uh, Spencer or for Phil, please uh, ask that. If you want to see what questions are there and you want to vote for which questions you'd like uh, to bring it to the top, please do that as well. Let's start this by uh, uh, asking the question of uh, what uh, you just uh, commented on, Spencer. What is a theological approach to the Book of Mormon, and how is that different from all the other approaches to the Book of Mormon that are out there right now? It's a great question, uh, Larry. We The, the series uh, had its genesis in a couple of apostolic um addresses. One uh, was an address Elder Jeffrey R. Holland gave to the Maxwell Institute where he challenged us to uh, be able to translate our work for an audience uh, as broad as the church is, at, at least as best we can. And the other was a, uh, a quote uh, from Elder Maxwell that I came across where um, he said we've scarcely begun uh, to understand the Book of Mormon and that its quote divine architecture would become more clear to us as we expended more effort um, as scholars, and that traditional scholars and scholars on what he called the cutting edge were both needed in that uh, in that work, and that th those two apostolic comments worked in us and in our back and forth the question of what's the next thing we can do at the Maxwell Institute. The the, the coming curriculum year kind of loomed large in our minds, and we decided. Um, we decided that this would be a way to have uh, an aspect of study on the Book of Mormon that hadn't gotten a lot of attention to uh, to give it more attention. Um, there have been in particular, questions. yeah, yeah, and there have been doctrinal approaches to the Book of Mormon. There have been fine um, commentaries um, on uh, on the Book of Mormon from a doctrinal standpoint. Uh, but we, we moved away from doctrine as an organizing idea, leaving to prophets and apostles that, I, that, uh, that declaration of doctrine as their province. We leaned toward theology because of the, the word itself, in a way. Originally, the word meant uh, God talk. And we've come to think of theology as a kind of refined academic exercise with big words and, uh, and, and, and thick books, but we intend theology here to signal something slightly different, and that is when you and I in, in our families, or you and I in our uh, gospel doctrine classes, back when we used to have those, uh, when we talk about God, when we reflect on scripture, we're doing theology whether we know it or not, and so to, this series hopes to model a kind of rigorous thinking about God, a reflective thinking about God that's certainly informed by academic fields ranging from literary studies to, uh, to, to history to philosophy, but uh, to model a way for all of us to think more deeply about Scripture. Phil, add some. <laughs> well, not? I would just add that... Uh Theology is an off-putting word even among many, many members of the church, including um, some very well-schooled members of the church. I think the underlying idea is who needs theology or theologians? We have prophets. So, as Spencer suggested, these um, volumes are not an attempt to um, pronounce official doctrine for the church. They're not an attempt to displease, uh, displace inspired leaders. But what would happen, we asked ourselves, if we brought... It, I, maybe I should back up and say anybody reading a scriptural text or any kind of text is not reading the text in some objective way. Rather, they're bringing to bear their own religious background and commitments or their secular background and commitments and their understanding of the outside world 
and their personal experience. All of us, when we encounter a text, are doing that. What would happen is what we asked ourselves, is if we brought some extraordinary disciple scholars who are both faithful and schooled in some of the disciplines that Spencer alluded to, took those first-rate minds and spirits and asked them to achieve simplicity while yet probing deeply and self-consciously and deliberately doing what all of us do naturally. Um, looking at the text with their religious commitments, the whole tradition, in concert with their experience of the carefully observed world through scholarship and through science and any, any tools that we have to enhance our access to the outside world and their personal intuitions and experiences. Those three things woven together and um, each of our authors were invited, strongly urged, sometimes smacked around to um, achieve simplicity, do all that, and then make it accessible to folks who can read as college-level readers. You know, you know we, we consider, consider the, the, uh, we we consider consider the Book, Book of Mormon, Mormon to, to be world, world scripture, scripture like, like other, other world, world scripture. scripture. And, and so, so the question, question would be, how would, would this series help members, members of other faiths understand the Book of Mormon and understand it in that context? It's a great question. I, th I think, in, I mean, in, in some ways, uh, something only gets to count as scripture if it continues to sustain the community that claims that about a text. If a, if a text quits sustaining us, quit, quits giving life to uh, and, and fueling our spiritual life, is it scripture? And so for Latter-day Saints, the Book of Mormon continues to do that. And so I think anyone not of our faith who wants to understand us as a neighbor will have to grapple with that text and the ways that it inspires our religious lives, inspires our, our kind of religious striving, and so the, the, the fact that for us, as Latter-day Saints, the Book of Mormon continues to both probe and answer and provoke us on questions of ultimate reality, the nature of God, the, the being of Christ, the nature of the human predicament, what's the problem that we all find ourselves in or the problems, what are the answers that God has provided for those problems, how does the individual and the community relate um, what's the what's a, what's the good in the world? What's the right in the world? What's the, the 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 way of holiness in the world? The Book of Mormon inspires and provokes all of us on those questions, and so I think anyone anyone wanting to understand us from the outside, hopefully we want to understand them as neighbors. Um, they they would have to watch us wrestle with the text and see the way that text. It inspires those deep questions and inspires a life out of those questions. And, and, that's, and, the, and the series is after those kinds of big questions, the questions that have kept the philosophers and the theologians up at night, as it were, uh, through the ages. And so I... I the, so, so, yeah, go ahead. So, so, how, how, so, so how, how does, does that, that help them understand us? The Winslow Foundation, for example, has created a series of books that we're uh, pre beginning to publish called Understanding Your Neighbors. In other words, for us to understand our Jewish neighbors, our Catholic neighbors, our uh, and, and our Muslim neighbors and so forth. So if, if we were to write a book from their perspective, Understanding Your Latter-day Saint Neighbors, how does this help them understand their Latter-day Saint neighbors? neighbors? Here's one way, um, Larry, is that the Book of Mormon can stimulate us and provoke us to all those things that Spencer described or not. And one way it cannot is it can seem to some who are not members of the faith, and even to some who are, by the way, it can seem foreign, it can seem foreboding, it can seem long, it can seem antique. Mark Twain found it chloroform in print famously, it can seem boring, tedious, preachy, off-putting, there's good guys and bad guys, the characters can seem flat to some audiences. Um, so if it seems foreign and long 
to you, my, my Presbyterian or atheist or Buddhist neighbor who is not inside the church, um, maybe you could sample one book. Maybe you could take the book of Jacob and pair it with this little tiny skinny book by Deidre Green that's reflecting on Jacob and see how one of our thoughtful Latter-day Saints engages this one text. If you taste something that addresses some of those existential questions that Spencer alludes to, come, we have more books in the Book of Mormon and we have more books in this series that might be helpful. Well, well and I, you know, you know, that, that, that's, that's important, important because, because we, we believe, believe that, that the Book of Mormon, Mormon speaks, speaks to, to the, the world. world. So to have the world understand how it applies to them and their understanding to us seems to me to be really important. So I think one of the things we have to ask ourselves when anytime you publish a series is what are you expecting people to do differently once, once they've they read, read this series? series? What's, What's the, the impact, impact uh, that you're hoping the series will have, will have on, on the audience, audience itself, itself that they, that they aren't, aren't getting, getting from, from other places? places. Are you about to speak? Spencer's oh. breathing here. Go ahead. No, I, 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 I'm <laughs> pausing to see if we want more on that one or if we want to go to the next question, Larry. What? Yeah, you, you guide us. Uh, well, well it, 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 if, you if you want, want to, move to move to the next, next one, one uh, I, think, I think let me let just give one short piece of, uh, of answer to that. And that is any series, this or any other series, if it doesn't cause you or me or, or, or the reader to say what is now changing in my life because I have now read this, then it probably misses the mark. And I'm sure that that's what you had in mind, all of you who wrote this, the marvelous series, is to help people say what has changed in my life now that I've seen this, known this, and, and got this in my life. Um, how has, how has it, changed it changed your, your perspective, perspective about, about the, the principles principle style in the Book of Mormon? And how does that apply to your life in the community that you serve? So we've been, uh, so Phil and I, uh, one of the reasons we're starting the, the series tonight is that we're the general editors of the series, uh, which means we are uh, grateful readers of all of these volumes as they've developed over time. Uh, and so we, we come uh, tonight partly as fans and as uh, folks who are, uh, who, are, who are grateful for the way that these authors model a kind of deep dive on each volume. And so for me, um, all sorts of principles have taken on new light. I think of the, I think of the Book of Mormon as like, like a diamond with all of these facets that I can walk by and sense its brilliance in a flash. But the longer I look at it, the more intricate that those facets seem, the more interesting that object becomes, the, the more time and more care I take in the observation. And that's what these authors have done. Uh, so there are lots of ways um, that they've done that for me. For instance, in the, in, uh, we'll hear next from Joseph Spencer who writes on First Nephi. Uh, and Dr. Spencer here at BYU slowed me way down to consider how the original chapter divisions in the Book of Mormon break the narrative differently than the modern chapter divisions do. This is not an item I'd spent right, right. a lot of time on. I had, not, I had not compared the original dictation chapter breaks with the modern chapter breaks. And, and to some, for some of us, that might seem like, well, that's a secretarial issue. It's a formatting issue. It's not a theological issue. Dr. Spencer makes it a theological issue. And he shows how the story changes slightly with those original dictation chapters that Joseph Smith offered in that 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon. The, the, the chapters were later shortened, broken into verses, and so on. And a little something is added with that bit of scholarship that he injects, and it shows Nephi with a particular care for a certain kind of narrative about covenant. Now, I knew covenant was important for Latter-day Saints, and for the Book of Mormon. But I see it in a new light now because of the way that he's able with careful scholarship to show how that narrative changes. I won't give it all away, 
because I, 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 want, I want you to see him do his thing. But that's one example of a way that scholarship from a slightly different angle slows us down, helps us see a facet a little differently, and a, and a principle that we knew was there kind of glistens in new light. And that's, that's, that's exactly what happened to me. And I could go volume by volume to show that, hey, this, this careful kind of theological um, method of close reading, of reflection, of comparison, of narrative analysis, of structural analysis, really pays some dividends for non-scholars. Folks who I, I, I haven't been trained as Dr. Spencer has, I'm not a philosopher, but he showed me a way uh, to approach First Nephi that's changed First Nephi for me, and I'm grateful. I'm a grateful reader for it. That's one example of a principle like covenant that's, that's come alive for me in new ways because of a different scholarly angle that I was not trained to pursue. One thing you said, Spencer, applies to your previous question, Larry, and that is it was a theme that became evident through all the volumes to the authors themselves and to us and to audiences who have heard um, some public comment about this slow down. That's one so what about changing scripture and prayer and other things for that matter. Slow down. There's way more here than you expected. Let me give a different sort of example because I asked myself even today one good question that should come out of this conversation is so what? Just so what for our friends who are not members of the church or church members? And I gave, I thought of um, a number of examples, but I'm going to take license to read a paragraph to you from one of the volumes, if you'll um, permit me. Adam Miller, yeah, yeah, please. Adam Miller um, has taken on the Book of Mormon in the Book of Mormon. And um, the Book of Mormon, he says, his first line in his introduction to his book is, Mormon is a terrifying book. It is a book about time, about the cost of time, and about what happens when we run out of time, as we all are. <laughs> he doesn't say that, but that's what he's driving at in his book. And here's the paragraph. This is not John Lennon um, writing beautiful music and saying, imagine that no religion. But rather, Adam writes, imagine a certain kind of religion. This will change your perspective. Imagine a religion that required you to lose your life to save it. Imagine a religion whose introductory ritual required you symbolically to die, to be buried, and then to rise from the grave, committed now to living what remained of your life as something that belonged not to you, but to God, bearing his name filled with his spirit, acting as his agent. Imagine a religion that might at any time ask you, as Jesus did, the rich man, to sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor. And what would that mean to take it seriously? It took Mormon's perspective of an apocalypse, of a collapse, economically and socially and environmentally and militarily of his civilization to say what would what Adam calls apocalyptic discipleship look like and then submits an exploration of that theme through the book. If one takes those words seriously that would change an angle of vision. That's, That's a marvelous, a marvelous statement, statement. And I, I look, look forward, forward to reading, reading the old, uh, volume. I also look forward to reading uh, perspectives on uh, uh, Alma chapter 34. Uh, they're just, uh, uh, that is so central to our theology, as you say, uh, that I'm looking forward to that myself. Um, uh, sort of a side question, gorgeous, beautiful artwork, marvelous artwork in here. Uh, Please, how did you come about that, and, and what did they do to create that in a way that matches so much the, the words on the page? On the, the physicality of the book? 
Um, we, uh, we, we, we wanted it to be brief, we wanted it to be handy, we wanted it to be uh, in, relatively inexpensive for Latter-day Saints, but we wanted it to be uh, an, an artifact that did its own kind of justice to the, to the, to the topic that we're pursuing. So we've, uh, we've, we've got an, an incredible team of, uh, of artists, uh, really. Uh, a little closer? I wonder if that can... Uh, you can't see it perfectly, but you can kind of see it. Brian Krzyznik is the, the lead artist. Um, and he has done uh, woodcut art for the Book of Mormon previously. We, we use some of that art here. That if, you've, if you bought a copy, um, you, you've noticed that it, the cover is debossed. It uh, participates in that same kind of effect of a woodcut. Um, and throughout, uh, Brian's done marvelous um, uh, little images uh, throughout uh, each volume. He's worked closely with our designer, Doug Thomas, who's worked hard as a designer and typesetter to, to um, have the book visually slow us down, to have the books um, draw, draw us in to an experience of the Book of Mormon. Again, all of the volumes point us back to the text in interesting ways, um, and we've We've wanted the, um, the visual aspect of the work to function alongside the text as a kind of comment on the nature of spirituality, too. We've wanted those visual images to stop. And so it's, it's been interesting to be a part of that process. Brian has uh, worked with the authors. He's asked each of them to provide key words to him that can kind of generate um, some creativity on his part. He's wrestled with the text himself. And then Phil and I and Doug and Brian um, engage with each author's feedback to um, talk through images that can convey some of these themes in a, in a way that, will, again, will slow readers down, draw them into the experience. Um, and so we're, we're quite proud of what they came up with. Would you hold that one up? Yeah. Um, here's a different one, the book of Jacob, again, Deidre Green's. Um, what we we did not think of these, um, everything that just Spencer just said that went into these volumes, we did not think of them as decorations. This is not sitting in your house and there's a blank spot, we better pop up a picture. These rather are invitations, the textuality of those woodcuts in reverse pattern in the covers. What do we call those, Dean Bats? Yeah. Those are dingbats. You'd be amazed to sit with Brian Kershiznik and have dozens upon dozens of uh, dingbats as we experimented. But just stick with the cover for a minute. These are, are um, not decorations. They're textual invitations to come deeper. And they reminded me faintly, I don't know that Brian had this in mind, but I, every time I touch one of these or see it, I feel the process. Spencer and I have been over in his shop and seen some of the whittling going on, and it um, evokes the etchings on the gold plates themselves. These are tactile things, touchable things, and the art, um, art isn't again a decoration for theology. It's another expression, another path to the spiritual. It's another kind of language that even is a kind of de facto um, theology. And maybe finally, we began to notice, and then we had an explicit conversation about it, that each of these volumes that Brian was producing had hands in them. These are, um, when the Book of Mormon talks about faith not as an abstract thing or an um, entity or action or state of being on its own, but faith unto repentance, faith leading somewhere. These are hands that are holding, hands that are blessing, hands that are pointing, hands that are touching, hands that are signifying. Um, these are the gospel in action in a tactile, visual, heart, head way. Not decorations. 
While Larry's working with his audio, I might add one more thing. Some of you, many of you will know the artist Brian Kershiznek, whom we mention, but um, if you don't, you likely do know his art and um, perhaps the most or one of the most iconic images in Latter-day Saint um, culture and consciousness right now is his um, famous work of a kneeling woman that, um, with a horde of angels coming down attending to her. The title of the work is um, She Will Find That Which Is Lost or She Will Find What Is Lost. Um, Brian in dialogue with partners knows how to extract theology from narrative and cast it in image. I'm going to go to the questions you've all suggested. This this first question comes from Katie in one of the comments. Katie, thanks for this. Uh, you're curious how we pick the authors for each book. This was quite a process. Um, we, we started, um, I started with the conviction and Phil shared it, that um, that we have a generation of Latter-day Saints scholars that was prepared to make a contribution in this theological lane um, and that uh, the time was perfect for this with uh, scholars from uh, kind of a rising generation of scholars. So we, we set about trying to um, identify scholars who could um, thread this particular needle, that they uh, were interested and had training such that they could provide a kind of fresh theological angle on a book, but also they were motivated not just academically, but as disciples themselves to uh, translate that work for a broader LDS audience. And so um, we had a uh, we had all but one of our initial invitees say yes, and the one that couldn't had good reason not to. Everyone else said yes, and that, that, that showed us we were on the right track for one thing. They were all motivated to uh, pursue this kind of project. So we were looking for uh, diversity both in terms of men's voices and women's voices. We were looking for those with training in some in history, some in philosophy, some in theology, some in literary studies. We wanted these different kinds of angles uh, different kinds of scholars uh, with that different kind of training in part to model for all of us that there isn't one way to approach scripture. We were trying in the diversity of voices to model for all of us that there is a, that, that each reader, it, it, we want to kind of give license to approach scripture in her or his own way. Uh, and so that's, um, that's how we chose those authors uh, to, to kind of find that kind of diversity um, in those voices. Anything else you want to add there, Phil? No, just that the diversity cuts a number of ways. Um, we've had an exploration of, of the presence of women and the absence of women in the Book of Mormon in more than one volume, and not merely by authors themselves who happen to be women. Um, we have a range of new young voices and very established um, scholars so diversity cuts a number of ways our next question comes from jacob jacob when will each of the volumes be published the first five volumes are available now they're available on amazon they're av available from the byu store for those of you who are uh, close to byu or provo um and so they they, they are available at, we, we realize in a time of we had we had more elaborate plans uh, in a pre-COVID age to roll this series out to all of us. But they are, those first five are, are available. The next two volumes should be available in September. We're hopeful that um, both our Alma volumes will be available then. Uh, and then um, additional volumes coming every three weeks or so thereafter. So they'll all be out by the end of the year. Um, and, uh, but again, if you haven't started, uh, you've got five to read uh, to catch up anyway. So uh, thanks for that, Jacob. Um, That's a good question outside our series, maybe. Okay. We're, we're scanning, we're scanning, the, we're, we're reading these on the fly here, y'all. So uh, be patient with us as we're looking through here. Um, question uh how brief is brief uh, that that's great 
Uh, it looks like Blair answered in the comment, but for those that aren't reading the comments carefully, they're, they're typically between 20 and 30,000 words, um, about 150 pages. The text is pretty small because the volume size is small. We wanted to be able to throw that into a backpack or into a, a briefcase or a purse and take it with you. Um, we wanted it handy that way, uh, but they're, uh, they're designed to be read um, over a couple of days, maybe, if you, if you really can't escape uh, a volume. And there have, I've certainly had that experience with some of these, uh, no doubt. Um, but they, they're, um, they're designed to um, provoke us, to draw us in, to point us back to the text, and to bring us back to the text with new questions. So we hope that they're a handy part of, uh, of your kind of research library, too, that you can consider these authors kind of fellow travelers. Um, and, and so they're, they are brief. Um, I might also say that they're designed to be read, meaning they are inexpensive. Um, we had a reverse bidding war as we discussed how to make these available best. Fifteen ninety five, no, thirteen fifty. We ended up at nine ninety five. So they are accessible. Um, and a great question from Charlene. Uh, Charlene, thanks for this. Um, they can be purchased individually. They can't be purchased as a group yet because they're not all published yet. And so th there will eventually be a box set available. Um, I'll say this, um, the idea for the series was conceived in early 2019, which gave us um, not long to uh, get it out in time for this 2020 Book of Mormon curriculum year. The fact that any volumes are out is, strikes me as a, a, a bit of a, of a miracle. Uh, Academic publishing, for those in the know, uh, this is not a, uh, a, a high-speed endeavor. This, uh, this, this typically is a year it, just in production, but this series was conceived, written, edited, copy-edited, designed, artwork done, and printed. It'll be in, in about uh, less than two years for 12 volumes. So. No, not available as a box set with a discount yet, but uh, will be in the future. But for now, um, one at a time. And we, the only reason we can't sell them to you ahead of publication is that we, we can't even sell them online without a, a firm publication date. And these, these, have been, these publication dates have been hard to get as well because uh, publishing a 12-volume series in a pandemic has proven to be an interesting thing. We don't want to do again. Uh, we don't want to do it again. It's been, it's been wonderful, but it's been very difficult. So uh, they are coming one at a time for now, Charlene. Thanks for the question. We hope that uh, they'll all be available soon. Interesting question here, Phil. Do you want to take this one? I've taken the last two. Yeah. Um, Kevin, thank you for this one. Yeah. Kevin identifies himself as not a member of the church and wonders if the series presupposes the literal historical truth of the narratives presented in the Book of Mormon. Are there allegorical readings of the Book of Mormon that do not require assent to literal narrative? Um, historicity is taken for granted by most Latter-day Saints. Joseph presented the book as an account of ancient inhabitants of the world. Um, that's a large, miraculous claim that angels come and deliver um, gold plates to modern contemporary people after, um, after Joseph Smith, in this case, is invited to retrieve the ancient records um, from the Hill Cumorah. So that presents um, any thinking person with some obvious questions. Our series, as opposed to um, addressing issues of historicity or or the Book of Mormon as literature, or the reception history of the texts, all of which are important fields. Um, these books um, rather take the text as it is at face value to interchange with them um, in a way that extracts theological insight without addressing those particular questions. And I'll just add one footnote there. Most of the authors take historicity as a given themselves, so they will they will treat individual authors in the Book of Mormon as individual voices that that that, that lived that taught what's taught here, and so that's that's a given for most of the, for for the authors. Um, 
But as Phil says, it's that's not addressed. It's not addressed. It's not a. It's it, it's not a consuming question for the volumes themselves. It's a, it's a given, and then on to the theological content of each book. So great question, Kevin. Thank you for that. Um, I'm I'm seeing some additional questions in the in the comments over here uh, on the side um, about ebooks. Those those ebooks are available for the five that have already been released, and they are they will be available for future volumes. Um, ebooks in Spanish and French will be available as well eventually. Uh, many of you who've worked with translation know that that's a time-consuming affair, and so that is coming. It's not available yet, but is coming for the future for uh, Spanish and French speakers. Um, and then um, audiobook as well for um, each volume, and so you'll be able to to listen uh, in, in that way too. So all of those platforms will eventually be available for all the volumes ebook and audio available now for those that are already in print and the others coming uh, for others. Yes, good. We're, we're, we've got time for maybe a couple more here. Um, a question here about a bit uh, from Janine, who's a big fan of the art and uh, wondering why his woodcuts were selected for this project. Um, Last year, uh, I guess it's now, yeah, beginning of last year, uh, the Maxwell Institute released a study edition of the Book of Mormon. I'm tempted to grab it. Um, it's on my shelf. I have a very lovely assistant right in here. Thank you. <laughs> my wife, Holly, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we released the, the Book of Mormon, Another Testament of Jesus Christ, Maxwell Institute study edition, year before last. And... Um, Brian had been involved in that project for some time, and some of the some of his work for individual books became covers for this. Um, we were so impressed by Brian's work and so um, fascinated by his process. There's something about the tactility of his woodcuts that, for both Phil and I, we were kind of mesmerized by them. Um, when we were thinking about a kind of visual cue about a kind of Maxwell Institute. Um, approach to the Book of Mormon or offerings on the Book of Mormon, it seemed natural to continue that um, that kind of visual cue uh, to readers who appreciated the study edition. And, and, and truth be told, that study edition um, was executed with similar aims in mind to, to have readers slow down with, a, with different formatting and a different kind of apparatus to give them scholarly tools but for non-scholars to approach the text uh, more transformatively, more meaningfully, uh, more thoughtfully. Um, and so the, the study edition fits very well, frankly, with that series. We thought it was a nice touch because our aims with the study edition are not unlike our aims with the series, to have intellectual rigor um, be a way of seeking Christ and seeking holiness. And so the, Brian's great work kind of tied them together in that way. So that was a big reason why. And one of our um, listeners correctly points out that Brian Kershiznik spoke with Grant Hardy at one of our Maxwell Institute um, events celebrating the publication of the study edition that Spencer was just talking about. And he goes into a bit of uh, you can find that on the Maxwell website recorded, and he goes into some detail with imagery about the process of the cuts that might interest many of you. And in the comments, if you want to look, our public communications specialist, Blair Hodges, is posting links to that talk. If you want to cut and paste uh, that talk, um, Blair's very handy and put that there for you. I've got a couple of questions um, uh, before we conclude that are uh, as a way of kind of um, tipping our cap to these amazing authors. A couple of you, Joseph and Bobby, both ask, hey, who are these authors? Can you tell us who they are? Are they within the BYU community? Um, Twelve authors, um, all Latter-day Saints, so within the kind of uh, church worshiping community, but not all at BYU. Joseph Spencer writes on First Nephi. He's in the Department of, of uh, Ancient Scripture at BYU. Terrell Givens writes on Second Nephi. He's a senior research fellow here at the Maxwell Institute, working with Phil and me. Uh, Deidre Nicole Green writes on Jacob. She is a postdoctoral fellow here at the Maxwell Institute at BYU. Sharon Harris writes on Enos Jeremiah Omni. Sharon is an assistant professor of English here at BYU. James uh, Faulkner 
uh, writes on Mosiah. He is also a senior research fellow here at the Maxwell Institute. Uh, you can see we tip a little bit towards our in-house scholars, which is on purpose. Kylie Turley uh, writes on uh, the first half of Alma, and she is a uh, professor of English at BYU. The second half of Alma is done by Mark Rathall. He's a philosopher at uh, University of Oxford in England. Uh, Kimberly Matheson Berkey writes on Helaman. Uh, Kim is uh, at uh, Loyola University in Chicago studying theology. Daniel Becerra writes third and fourth Nephi on third and fourth Nephi. Dr. Becerra uh, recently joined the Department of Ancient Scripture at BYU, uh, fresh out of a PhD program at uh, Duke University in North Carolina. Uh, Adam Miller, a professor of philosophy at Collin College in Texas, writes on Mormon. Rosalind Franson Welch is an independent scholar in uh, outside St. Louis, Missouri. She writes on Ether. And the Moroni volume, our concluding volume, is written by Dr. David F. Holland, who is a professor of religion at the Harvard Divinity School. So those are our authors. Um, they are they're remarkable volumes. We're excited to introduce the series to all of you. Uh, we've enjoyed being able to talk about it with you uh, tonight. Um, Please see our website for more information about the series. It's mi.byu.edu slash brief. That will take you to our landing page about the series, and you can see about um, ordering volumes, more about the authors, um, uh, get images of the cover and so on, and get a better sense of the series. Um, what do you want to say, Phil, to sign off? Mm, thanks. We hope and presume for your indulgence and patience with our late start. Um, and it's a pleasure to be with you. We see from the comments um, and can otherwise intuit that there will be a lot more questions and room for conversation, but that's what we um, hope our evening um, accomplishes is to incite your interest in the rest of the series to come when the actual authors will be with us one by one. So it should be a good future for the series. It should. And <coughs> so uh, please register for the next uh, Book of Mormon Conversations, uh, sponsored here by the Maxwell Institute and the Witso Foundation. The next uh, in the series of conversations will feature Dr. Joseph Spencer. And um, you have It'll be a couple of weeks, just enough time to read that volume and be able to kind of chat live with the author about his exceptional work on First Nephi. Uh, Terrell Givens will follow a couple of weeks thereafter, but we hope this becomes uh, a great way to spend uh, some time on, on Sunday evening to, to enhance and provoke your, your uh, scripture study. Everyone, thank you for tuning in. Have a great evening. Thanks for all on both the Widso side and the Maxwell side helping to, to bring this about. Have a good evening, everyone. Thanks a lot. And Larry, if you're out there somewhere, we love you. Yeah. <laughs> See you, everyone. <laughs>